<coughs> so, um, just waiting to see if people are able to log on. Uh, and um, we'll go from there shortly. As always, notes are on the website and a link has been posted in uh, Facebook uh, for, for Facebook Live. And uh, we'll see how we go. Ah, there we go. Someone's logged on. Ah, okay. So, um, let's start. Let's start. Maybe some more people will log on as we go. Um, what I wanted to do this evening is talk a little bit about the Eucharist. Uh, often I'm looking at sort of scriptural stuff, theological stuff, and I've been thinking about the Eucharist and how it's such a central component of the way we do worship. And how over, over the last 15 years, the way it's sat with me has shifted. And I don't want to get into the, any of the conversations about anamnesis uh, or um, is it a memorial meal or, or transubstantiation or any of those sorts of things. Uh, partially because I don't necessarily think that they are super helpful. Uh, at least they don't help me. <laughs> <coughs> so, I want to talk a little bit about some of the areas that I think are worth accessing. Um, and so I've gone with talking about from perspectives of three different uh, thinkers who are bringing a very significant understanding to the Eucharistic meal. And uh, this is not going to plumb the depths of any of those, but hopefully it'll be engaging, helpful, interesting. So I thought I'd start with one of the scripture passages that we understand as being the, the start of the Eucharistic meal. And I chose the one from Mark's Gospel. And this is the, the meal that Jesus is having with his disciples uh, shortly before he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. He's arrested, trial, all those sorts of things. So Mark 14. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now, um, if you're ever... Uh, well, a little bit of background stuff. So... Um, Blood is life, and in Old Testament, in the covenants, we see signs of God having uh, offered himself, in a sense, for the covenant relationship. And so we see echoes here of Jesus offering himself uh, as the guarantor of the new covenant relationship between God and humanity. Uh, and this this meal, this, this taking of bread and blessing it and breaking it and sharing it, has become so central to the Christian faith and the way that people gather and worship. <coughs> it's also become a bit divisive. If I'm, it, you know, uh, it's become a place where people have argued, and I look not always helpful. <laughs> a lot of arguments often aren't. But what we cannot ignore is how many people have come together under all sorts of circumstances to, in some way, reconnect to that moment in history by engaging in that action of taking, blessing, 
breaking sharing. And I want to share with you some, some thoughts. So I want to start with some work from uh, theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He's very much famous for his uh, courage in, in resistance to uh, the Nazis he, and for being part of an attempt to assassinate Hitler. But he was also somewhat of a, I'm going to say radical theologian. He spoke about religionless Christianity. Uh, he, spoke, uh, he, he spoke about Christianity in a way that um, perhaps a lot of people wouldn't be familiar with. And he also spoke about the Table Fellowship, uh, the Eucharist. And in his uh, book, uh, The Life Together, he, he engages with it. So he says, to know Jesus Christ in the presence of these gifts, what does this mean? And if you've got the notes, I have um, put like excerpts from it. It means first to know him as the giver of all gifts, as the Lord and creator of this our world with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So for, for Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the participation in the Eucharist and the understanding that in this you know, in the Anglican Church, it's a little bit, little tiny piece of bread and a little sip of wine usually. But we can't even do all of that at the moment. Is to participate in being the recipient of a gift that is the gift of the creation, the creator of all things. And so we have that, we in this moment, taking into our mouths the gift of all creation. The second thing that comes out of this is that the fellowship, that's the church community, uh, acknowledges that all earthly gifts are given to it only for Christ's sake. So we are fed the bread and the wine. And in doing so, in a sense, we become gifts ourselves. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's this notion that the gift is through us and transforms us. So that we too become part of God's gift to the world. So by receiving, we're also being given. Uh, so uh, all the earth are given to it only for Christ's sake, and Christ's sake is the mission to the to the to the world. The the powerful love that God has uh, for creation, uh, as exemplified uh, in in Jesus Christ. So he's not only the giver, but the gift itself, and it's for him that all earthly gifts exist. Third, uh, the congregation uh, believes that its Lord wills to be present when it prays for his presence. Now, uh, that sort of sounds like a, um, an odd phraseology. But what it says is that when we get together and we share in bread and wine and we we pray that God's presence in Jesus Christ will be with us in the bread and in the wine we actually are living into this understanding of God which is quite incredible and that is the understanding that God's desire is to be with us that God is wants to be with us now that might not seem like too out there of a concept, but it's, it's an incredible idea that God desires our company. There are days I don't desire my company, um, and yet God desires to be with us. Isn't that fabulous? From a little bread, he's bringing a little sip of wine, and, and, and this is amazing. So it also has a sort of festive quality. So we're kind of getting close to Christmas. We're starting to see uh, Christmas decorations and shops and lights going up in a few spots. I love Christmas decorations. Um, so, uh, but 
so we're getting into that kind of festive season, the celebratory season. And this shared meal has a festive quality. And what it does is whenever we gather together, it reminds us that there is a cycle of life that involves hard work and celebration. And in fact, what, what it does is it makes the perp it gives the hard work that we do during the week meaning <clears throat> because it is sustained by participation in the presence of God. And so it gives meaning forwards and backwards to that hard work that we entail. <coughs> Bonhoeffer's um, phraseology, our life is not only travail and labor, it is also refreshment and joy in the goodness of God. Um, and, and that's fabulous. Uh, yeah. The other thing is, um, it, it, it implies obligation. Uh, it's, it's our daily bread that we eat. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. It's not just mine. We share our bread. Now, if we do that in a liturgical setting in church, we should also feel an obligation to continue that generosity, that sharing nature in all sorts of other aspects. I recall a poster that I saw uh, a number of years ago. And what it had was, it, it, on the poster it said, to pray, give us this day our daily bread, and not to share it, is heresy. So the participation, the sharing, reminds us that we are called to share uh, in God's blessings, uh, far more broadly than we would perhaps in, in other contexts. So... We get this really powerful set of messages that we rehearse whenever we gather together for the Eucharist. Whenever we come together, we rehearse those. We rehearse uh, the understanding that God is the giver of all gifts. That uh, we too are then gifts and we're part of God's gift to the world. Uh, we, we rehearse that God wants to be with us. So it's, it's an extension of the, the incarnation. The idea that in Jesus Christ, God is exercising God's desire to be with us. And in the Eucharist, we see that idea continued. And we get to celebrate it together. I'm going to move on from Bonhoeffer. Now, there's a lot more, and you could dig deep into any one of those uh, quite quite easily. Quite easily. So, uh, one of my favorite philosophy theologians is Peter Rowlands. And he speaks about uh, the Eucharist using kind of an old magic trick as a metaphor. So... Uh, you, you probably have heard the story that the term uh, abracadabra it comes from this idea that uh, stage magicians heard priests uh, saying words in, in Latin in the sanctuary and they kind of they jumbled them up possibly to mock the clergy possibly just because they didn't hear them properly and they came up with this term abracadabra and so Peter Rollins sees in magic tricks kind of a threefold pattern. Uh, the pledge, the turn, and the prestige. And if you think about it as like a disappearing trick, you know, say, uh, you give me a coin, and I've got the coin, and I go, oh, and I, and I make it vanish. So there's the pledge, and there's the turn. Oh, where's the coin? Where's the coin? And I'll bring it back, and it's in my other hand. I can't do magic. Um, <laughs> so we have this process. But interestingly, quite often, the prestige isn't the coin that was originally pledged. It can, you know, to for sleight of hand purposes, you shuffle it around a little bit. That's a similar coin or that sort of thing. 
So, in, in communion or the Eucharist, Peter Rowland sees a similar process. So the pledge is the, the presentation of the bread and wine as the sacred object. This bread is magical. This wine is magical. And he uses the word magical kind of on a multiple levels there. And so that's the pledge. This is ah, like you know, and the magician waving his wand and all the rest of it. And then we come and we take it. We, we take the bread and the wine. And we just have a little bit of bread and a little bit of wine. And we realize that it's actually bread and wine, but it's disappeared into us. And so now we're left with the, well, where is it? And we leave church and we go across the, to the hall for a cup of coffee. And we're sitting and we're chatting to uh, our neighbors or, or the little old lady lives down the street. And the little old lady says to us, oh, you know, on Wednesday, I've got to go in uh, to the hospital. I've got to get my knee done. And I'm really worried about uh, the cabs picking me up. And you go, you know what? I've got the morning off on Wednesday. I'll come and pick you up and I'll take you to the hospital. And I can't stick around for long, but I can do that. Not a problem. You see, what's happened is that we have become the prestige when we live into the pledge. When we live into the idea that this bread magically creates a community, when we actually act as that community, uh, we live into and we become a living example of the Eucharist, the communion. <coughs> so I love that partially because it works with that kind of that the picture of the of the magic trick. Um, once again, there's a lot more material in Peter Rowland's work, but it's a nice little kind of a picture to say, oh, okay, okay, I see where this is going. I see where this is going. Now I want to um, uh, bring in the work of Sam Wells, the Reverend Dr. Sam Wells. Um, he is, uh, I think he's currently the priest uh, at... Um, uh, St. Martin's in the field. Uh, and he is uh, one of the better English, Church of England uh, theologians. He has a deep, he, he brings a kind of a deep mystical heart and a, and a very keen mind to a range of theological questions and issues. Uh, worth looking at his material if you get a chance. Um, so, this material comes from, and I think I've got the link there, uh, or a description at least, uh, of a taught Eucharist that he did. So, a number of clergy do these sorts of things. Uh, I've done it in the past. Where as you're going through the service, rather than having kind of an extended sermon, you take little breaks to explain what's going on. And in the, in the hope, in the belief, that if we understand what's going on, then we can enter into it more fully. And so I've, once again, just grabbed excerpts from Sam Wells' work. And he asked the question, how can we become a people who can hear God speak in the scriptures? And, and you know, that's, that's a great way to describe the goal of church, of the gathering together hearing God speak in the scriptures. And Sam orients that on Jesus. Jesus was the moment in time when God opened his heart, or God opened our God's heart, and was and our human life uh, was fully and absolutely integrated with God. So the question is, oh, that happened 2,000 years ago. How can we access that? How can we now access something that happened 2,000 years ago? And Sam says, Jesus told us. He said, he took bread and wine, and he said, when you do these things, when you take bread, bless it, 
break it and share it. I'm with you. When you take wine and you bless it and share it, that's, my, that's me, that's my blood. And so everything we do at the Eucharist is about allowing our life to be shaped around Jesus. And during the service, we bring forward God's gifts and we lay them at the altar. In Deuteronomy chapter 26, uh, there's an instruction to the children of Israel to bring the first fruit. So that's the first little bit that's grown. We might think of it perhaps as a tithe or our offerings uh, in a basket and give them to the priest. So they come at the front and then tell the story of salvation. If you uh, listen to any of the Eucharistic prayers that we normally have in church, they rehearse the story of God's saving action in Jesus Christ. And so we rehearse that story. Uh, yeah, and so in doing that, our best understanding of how to respond to the gospel then, because remember in a service you've had the gospel and the sermon, uh, is we, we, we create food in a sense, that feeds us. So the best response to the good news of God is to consume the good news. Very visceral, isn't it? You know, I'm, I'm taking the good news and I am eating it. I am taking it into myself. Then we, we kind of move forward and we come to the question that in a sense is at the heart of the Eucharist. For, for, for Sam, what does it mean to be God's companions? And a companion literally means one with whom you share bread. Uh, so, panios, uh, panion, I think is sort of French for bread. So, coming companion, one that we eat bread together. So, we break bread with each other and with God. We are companions on this journey. <clears throat> and so we have seen, we have touched, we've heard, and we've tasted the Lord our God. We have actually consumed of God. The Eucharist is our entire body. It's a whole body experience living in a new society as God's companions together. And then we've just done this. We've just done this We've, we have the blessing ringing in our ears and we go out. Uh, we take our actions and our words and we, we have a goal to, uh, we have a goal uh, to, um, to take what we've heard, what we've seen, what we've done, what we've enacted into the world. And uh, Sam uses the, the metaphor, in a sense, of the blessing at the end uh, being a bit like throwing a ball for his golden retriever. Uh, and it's, it's the, the priest throws the ball, and we are, we, the whole congregation, are like gold, uh, golden retrievers. We are rushing out the door, chasing that ball, looking for an opportunity to engage with the world, having been renewed by the Eucharist, having uh, been uh, refreshed in it, seeing anew the holiness of the world, and we're looking to engage with it. So that when the time comes, next week, we come back with the ball in our mouths, excited by all the th places where we've seen the work of God in the world, and we have been preparing for a whole week for this feast that we engage in again. So uh, that's a little bit of the work of Sam Wells. I hope that was interesting for you. Um, now, like I said, there are many other people that have written quite extensively on the Eucharist. What I like about these is that they, they clearly draw the link between uh, ongoing lived experience, you know, taking the message into the world, 
and um, you know, it's not just a, it's not just a thing that happens just in church. It's a thing that happens out to to feed us as we go out into the world. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, so a few comments have come through. Um, Alex has said, "Rest my voice." Yeah, it'll come and go. It'll come back. Don't panic. Um, wet concrete and all those sorts of things. Uh, Simon has uh, said a great passage on Mark and the Lord's Supper. Oh, and he's barracking for Queensland uh, for the um, state of origin tomorrow. Um, yeah, I'm barracking for nap time. Um, <laughs> well, I think that's it in terms of comments. If anything else comes up, Feel free to post. Uh, yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, Nikki said that that was good. I'm glad you enjoyed. And um, I'll see you around. Oh, don't forget, this will end up on YouTube at some stage when I get around to it. Bye. Good night.